Good morning and welcome to our service online for Advent 2, the beginning of December. Uh, we look forward to being back in church uh, this morning as well. Uh, and uh, please do look out for notices on our services for Christmas and how you can sign up to come along if that would be something that you would like to do. We begin our worship this morning by singing Longing for Light. In the name of Christ, God's grace, mercy and peace be with you and also with you. We pray together. People went to deserted places to hear what was most important. We are gathered today on our pilgrimage towards the things that will last forever. Righteousness, loving kindness, peace and an eternal home. To you, O oh God, who calls all things towards the fullness of life. Amen. The poem, Come Back, Lord Jesus. Come back, Lord Jesus, and do not be slow. 
Refine, renew, restore. We hope, we yearn. When is this coming? Why can we not know how long we have to wait for your return? Come back, Lord Jesus, and do not be slow. Or help us in the lingering to learn your saving way that savors love and so refine, renew, restore. We hope, we yearn. Come back, Lord Jesus, and do not be slow. Refine, renew, restore. We hope, we yearn. So we bring to mind those times when we know we have failed our Lord and ourselves this week. And Louise leads us in our confession. Christ, the light of the world, came to dispel the darkness of our hearts. In God's light, let us examine ourselves and confess those things which we know have disrupted peace. Almighty God, we have turned our face from you whose face is always turned towards us. We have not always held on to what we know is just. We have ignored what we understand is true. We have refused to believe what should be believed. We have made mistakes with our words and deeds. We turn from this and turn our faces towards you, who waits for us and makes us ever new. Amen. God forgives you. Forgive others. Forgive yourselves. Through Christ, God has put away your sin. Approach your God in peace. Amen. So we light our second Advent candle for the second coming of Christ. He will return, ending pain and fear, restoring the world to life. Jesus, we trust in your return. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Help us live with patient hope. O come, O come, Emmanuel. collect for the second Sunday of Advent. Almighty God, purify our hearts and minds that when your Son Jesus Christ comes again as Judge and Saviour, we may be ready to receive him who is our Lord and our God. Amen. Henry reads our Gospel for us this morning. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Glory to you, O Lord. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me, 
I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptised you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Daphne preaches for us this morning. Mark begins his gospel as he means to go on, in a journalistic style, full of often gritty and to the point sound bites. He wants us to encounter John the Baptist right at the beginning of his gospel. Mark is telling us, look at this man, listen to him. It is your last chance to hear the genuine voice of the long line of prophets that God has been sending us for centuries to prepare us for something far greater. Now it is about to happen. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now we meet John. Even the way Mark brings him on stage is striking. John appeared in the desert, in the wilderness. One minute he was not there, and the next minute he was. This fits in with everything about John. He suddenly faces people. He is there before they can take evasive action. His style is neither gradual nor gentle. Mark introduces him, proclaiming repentance. John believes in confronting people. We see before us the most extraordinary figure. John, straight from the wilderness, bursting upon the scene, dressed in a quite bizarre fashion, reminding many of Elijah. He was the antithesis of all other prophets, clothed in camel hair, and with a leather belt round his waist. He was no well-fed figure, having existed on a diet of wild locusts and honey. A real odd bod, by all accounts. Prophets are a rare breed. They had been a rare breed in Israel for a long time. There hadn't been one since Malachi, 400 years earlier. People did not know how to handle prophets, definitely not the sort of person anyone wanted in their front room. A prophetic voice is an embarrassment and is rarely understood within the walls and plans of the establishment. So John operated in the desert, in the wilderness of Judea, and the people flocked to hear his message. The wilderness has a special significance in the relationship between God and his people. It is in the wilderness that God calls Moses from the burning bush to lead his people out of Egypt. It is in the wilderness that the children of Israel wander for 40 years while they learn what it is to be the people of God. After his baptism by John, Jesus is led into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan and filled with the Holy Spirit. It was a measure of the importance of John's future work that he required the kind of spiritual preparation that only the wilderness can give. When the word comes to John, it sets off something that will change the world. To realise how powerful an effect John had, we need to be aware of a little basic geography. It is a long way from the city of Jerusalem to the banks of the River Jordan. There is a huge descent to get there and a challenging climb to return home again. To go at all required a major decision. Yet Marx tells us that crowds from the Judean countryside and people from the whole of Jerusalem were flocking to hear him walking in the heat for hours and hours. Immediately, we're made to realise the huge impact he was making on society. We are bound to notice how he comes. He comes preaching. 
John's call is the drum roll, announcing that salvation is near. He calls people to repentance for the forgiveness of their sins and to baptise them as a mark of their decision to lead a new life. John tells the people that the whole point of his presence and his words and work are to prepare them for someone else far greater than him. John brought a powerful challenge to the rulers and religious leaders of the day who lived in considerable luxury. He called on them to totally change their lifestyle, told them they needed a total change of mind and heart. His courage was tremendous. He was uncompromising. He did not mince his words. In Matthew's account, he refers to the leaders as you brood of vipers. There was nothing woolly about John, and yet, with striking humility, he sees himself as nothing more or less than the voice through which God was addressing his nation. He takes no credit for his ministry. He is simply his master's voice. John did not invent baptism. The Pharisees had devised it long before for Gentiles who were drawn to the Jewish faith. With ritual circumcision and sacrifice and baptism, which would wash away the pollution of their former life. John demanded a similar baptism for the Jews themselves, for they too needed a rigorous new beginning. John's baptism is not a sign that all the preparation work has been accomplished. It is a sign that the preparation work had begun and that people are beginning to involve themselves in preparing for the one to come, for the long-awaited Messiah. The quotation from Isaiah is highly significant. It speaks of roadworks ahead, bends to be straightened, traffic rerouted, and plenty of employment for all. Roads in those days were simply tracks on the hard-baked earth, apart from the occasional highway built for prestige purposes by some king. These special roads were built by the king's command and maintained as the king required for journeys he was going to make. Local inhabitants would be ordered to prepare the king's highway for him. That is how John sees his mission. He is there to put right, not the landscape of Palestine, but to invite the people to change their ways, which means a change of heart. It is Jesus' way that John is preparing, and to prepare the way of the Lord is John's obsessive sentence, centre of his vision. Would that it were ours. John goes on to proclaim that there is to be an outward transformation too. The deserts and rough terrain will become a highway for God. This is a reminder that when the Messiah comes, not only will his people be saved, but creation will be restored. Only a few had recognised the coming, the advent of the Messiah among them, Mary and Joseph, the shepherds, Simeon and Anna, the Magi. But on that day, the Messiah will be universally seen and acknowledged. But where does this leave us now? Just as God called John the Baptist to prepare the way for the Lord, so God calls each one of us to fulfil our special purpose. What is at the heart of your preparations? I'm not talking about the shopping for food and presents, decorating the tree and writing the cards and getting them in the post on time. People took time out to listen to John, and like these people, we too can go to the desert to meet God, especially during the season of Advent. We have been living in extraordinary strange and confusing times these last months. It could be a good time to sort out the spiritual clutter in our lives. Moses, John and our Lord all found God in the desert. It is still the place to meet with God. 
The desert can be a place of new beginnings, a place of nourishment. It is where we can ultimately come to terms with God and with ourselves. Each of us is but a grain of sand in the desert, but we are very much part of the overall picture, all part of the one church with our own part to play. John had his part to play, his limited role in God's larger plan. John's place in God's larger plan is a lesson with broader implications for us all. When Christ came, John knew it was time for him to bow out. He was aware of the difference of his baptism and the baptism of Jesus. John could only baptise with water. Jesus would baptise with the Holy Spirit. John saw himself as a very unimportant person. He said he was not even worthy to untie Jesus' sandals. His message was limited, as was his baptism. John leaves us in no doubt that it was in Jesus' ministry that real spiritual renewal would be found. A voice. That was what John saw himself to be. A voice to utter words, to convey a message, to speak the truth. This was John's God-given role. He was the herald of the coming Messiah and his voice was lifted up to testify to him and call upon all people to find in him their Saviour and Lord. John spoke with humility. So should we. Our role is to point to the unknown Christ in our midst so that men, women and children may recognise him, welcome him and worship him as their king. In the words of the Advent hymn, hark the glad sound, the Saviour comes, the Saviour promise long, let every heart prepare a throne and every voice a song. Amen. Louise leads us in our affirmation of faith. We believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth, the one who is full of patience, who is not afraid of silence, who does not need to fill each moment with activity and noise, the one who is beyond bluster and flurry, and who does not jostle for attention. We believe in God the Son, saviour of creation, who slipped into Bethlehem one night, mostly unnoticed, who lived 30 years without headlines or hurry, who frequently took time alone with his patient father, who waited for the right time to become the suffering servant, who stood quietly before the noise of his accusers, whose silence overpowered their words, who died, then rose again on a quiet Sunday morning. We believe in God, the Holy Spirit, who strengthens, empowers, renews and refreshes, sometimes arriving with obvious power, sometimes with the quiet breath of a whisper. We believe in one God, who patiently waits for us, and who longs for us to do the same. Scarlett and Liam lead our intercessions. We pray for those lost in valleys. May they be lifted up. For those stuck in the heights. May they be helped down. For those in barren places. May they find shelter. For those in rough places. May they hear eternal words. For those seeking forgiveness. May they find it. For those seeking apology. May they hear it. For those waiting for a long time. May they find patience in your patience. 
for those waiting for renewal. May there be springs of growth. Our Year's Mind Mabel Hawker Joyce Calderwood Connie Comer Stan Habgood William Simpson Brendan Blood and Roger Ford Amen, Amen. In the tender mercy of our God, the day spring from on high shall break upon us to give light to those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Look upon us in mercy, not in judgment. Draw us from hatred to love. Make the frailty of our praise a dwelling place for your glory. Amen. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. At your command, all things came to be, the vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. By your will, they were created and have their being. Glory to you forever and ever. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the stewards of creation. Glory to you forever and ever. But we turn against you and betray your trust, and we turn against one another. Again and again you call us to return. Through the prophets and sages, you reveal your righteous law. In the fullness of time, you sent your son, born of a woman, to be our saviour. He was wounded from, for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. By his death, he opened to us the way of freedom and peace. Glory to you forever and ever. Therefore, we praise you joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles and martyrs, and with those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, Lord our God, for sending us Jesus the Christ, who on the night he was handed over to suffering and death, took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, gave it to his friends and said, take this and eat it. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup of wine. He gave you thanks and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shared for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Glory to you for ever and ever. Gracious God, we recall the death of your son, Jesus Christ. We proclaim his resurrection and ascension, and we look with expectation for his coming as the Lord of all the nations. We who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the spirit now bring you these gifts. 
Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this offering of your church, that we who eat and drink at this holy table may share the divine life of Christ our Lord. Glory to you forever and ever. Pour out your spirit upon the whole earth and make it your new creation. Gather your church together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom, where peace and justice are revealed. That we, with all your people of every language, race and nation, may share the banquet you have promised through Christ, with Christ and in Christ. All honour and glory are yours, creator of all. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one brain. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, who sent your son to redeem the world and will send him again to be our judge, give us grace so to imitate him in the humility and purity of his first coming, that when he comes again, we may be ready to greet him with joyful love and firm faith through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A new song for us this morning from Tim Hughes, I Will Wait For You.
May God himself, hope of the world, make you perfect and holy and keep you safe in spirit, soul and body for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you and those you love and pray for always. Amen. In Christ, we are a new creation, remade, renewed, restored. Jesus, you will come again, perfecting all of creation, remade, renewed, restored. Help us live in the light of your coming, lives of grace and peace. Remaking, renewing, restoring. Send us out to bless the earth and bless all people. Remaking, renewing, restoring. Amen.